Since we have officially entered the spooky season, I wanted to take a brief break from the political projects I've been working on and spend some time with one of my other passions, horror films, particularly of the more strange and obscure variety. In the modern horror media landscape, overflowing with blockbuster jump scare cinema a la The Conjuring, it is very easy for audiences to potentially overlook gems like the work of Italian horror director Lucio Fulci. A sort of blockbuster horror auteur of his day, Fulci is most remembered today for his use of extreme gore. Now, I won't deny that this type of delightful hyperviolence in his films was not an initial draw. Watching a handful of his most well known features, it is very true that their bloody reputation accurately precedes them. The Beyond, one of the first of his that I watched, is often remembered for an iconic scene where an arachnophobe, you can tune out for a second here, a man's face is torn off by a mass of tarantulas. All the man-eating spiders aside, though, I was struck the first time I watched it by the energy that the Beyond put off. It was a zombie movie, sure, and I'll talk about the plot specifics in a little bit. But the atmosphere, the atmosphere was that of a cosmic horror story. It had a distinctly weird quality. Weird in the inscrutable Lovecraftian sense. The Beyond is in fact the second film in Lucio Fulci's Gates of Hell trilogy the movies of which are all united by this same sense of eldritch weirdness. These three movies, The City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, and The House by the Cemetery, can be a bit difficult to discuss, if only because the dream logic that holds the trilogy together grows thicker with each entry. A lot of what I have to say about them, though, was articulated in my head while I was reading culture theorist Mark Fisher's essay, The Weird and the Eerie, his treatise on those two particular modes of horror and how we view and interact with them. As I mentioned, this video is going to be dealing with the weird in the aspects of Lucio Fulci. My next video, though, which should be coming about sometime next month, is going to be covering the eerie cinema, of Japanese director Kiyoshi Kurosawa, focusing on the loosely linked thematic trilogy of Cure, Pulse, and Retribution. So those interested can certainly stay tuned for that. In the introduction to The Weird and the Eerie, Fisher takes time to divorce both of these concepts, or modes of fiction he calls them, from the predominant analytical lens of Freud's Unheimlich which is often used when examining works of horror and science fiction. The Unheimlich, popularly translated as the uncanny, is understood to refer to the opposite of whatever we come to expect from reality, the strange inversion of the everyday, if you will. As examples, Freud discusses doubles, strange repetitions, seemingly impossible coincidences, all things that are akin to the normal, but which instill a sense of anxiety instead of comfort. While the weird is similar to the Unheimlich, Fisher offers this definition as both a clarification and a differentiation. The weird is that which does not belong. The weird brings to the familiar something which ordinarily lies beyond it, and which cannot be reconciled with the homely even as its negation. The first and easiest example of the weird that Fisher offers is the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, whom he credits with popularizing the weird in a literary form. Anyone who has read Lovecraft is familiar with the core conceit of his work, the confrontations between humans and cosmic beings of an immense and inconceivable power, thematically centered around the ultimate smallness and insignificance of the human condition. Watching Fulci's films, particularly those in the Gates of Hell trilogy, one can certainly see modern iterations of these themes occurring there. While no great old ones or any such creatures make an appearance, 
all three films are fixated on the horror of forces beyond human comprehension. The name of the trilogy itself comes from the reoccurring motifs of the seven gates of hell, described as locations where the world becomes warped by great suffering or tragedy. The first film, The City of the Living Dead, is about a psychic who experiences a vision of one of these gates opening in a small town when a local priest commits suicide, and about the reporter that travels with her to then close the gate. The weird most obviously manifests in the rising of the dead. While most zombies may be seen as banal, and perhaps more unheimlich, Fulci's are far more bizarre. They have an uncertain corporeality, riding the line between physical zombies and returned spirits. They have the ability to teleport from place to place, to phase through the barriers we normally see as protections from the uncanny threat that normal zombies present. And that changes them from a simple reanimated corpse to an alien presence. These zombies are also distinct in that they can be killed just like normal humans can be killed, without the requirement for headshots or any kind of special maneuvers. They are, in effect, less like your typical Hollywood zombie and more like a person simply stripped of their soul, their core humanity, by the alienating power of the weird. This is an idea compounded by the fact that the majority of people who are turned are not done so through a bite like would be expected, but instead by having the back of their heads torn open, akin to their minds being violently torn out through the open wound. Even more foreign to our expectations is the fact that these zombies seem to be directed by a remnant of the dead priest. I use the word remnant because it most accurately covers his nebulous, terrifying nature. The narrative never clarifies if this being is the spirit of the priest himself, or some kind of eldritch entity using the priest's form to manifest itself. While far less corporeal than the zombies he commands, he is also far more powerful. His mere presence drives characters to literally die of fear. With just his stare, he can inflict strange and brutal violence on those who encounter him. In this movie's most memorable gore sequence, a priest compels a teenage girl to vomit up her intestines and stomach. It is a fantastically and terrifyingly composed scene, with the camera cutting from the girl's frozen, bleeding eyes to the stare of the undead priest and back again. Throughout the film, he seems to exist on this level above the mindless corpses around him. He is a malevolent and lucid presence, driving the weirdness of the film. Another fundamental aspect of the weird, as discussed by Fisher, is the function of thresholds in weird fiction, often used to demarcate the weird from the typical. Fisher argues that the transgression of the threshold is what makes the weird threatening. As he says, the weird denaturalizes all worlds by exposing their instability and their openness to the outside. The Gates of Hell films, as the name implies, shares this notion of the permeability of reality. Fulci's thresholds are most often realized as the transition from the city to the country, from the developed to the undeveloped, the regions ruled by man to the regions ruled by things far stranger. All three films feature characters leaving New York City specifically, all for various reasons and thus passing through the threshold into the weird. City of the Living Dead leads its characters to the fictional village called Dunwich. The Beyond travels down to the far bayous of New Orleans, and the house by the cemetery takes its characters to a small village in Boston. This dichotomy of locale 
he is made far more frightening by the subtle infiltrations of the country into the city. In each film, the audience becomes more and more aware of the esoteric influence the former has on the latter. Now, unlike City of the Living Dead, which is strange but also relatively coherent, the beyond revels in the dream logic that comes to define the trilogy as a whole. It opens with a flashback sequence in which an artist staying in a New Orleans hotel is tortured and killed by a mob who accuses him of practicing black magic. Meanwhile, a blind woman is seen reading from a book entitled Abon, a book of prophecies and magic, and describing the opening of one of the gates of hell. These books are one of the strange links between each of the three films. The City of the Living Dead references the Book of Enoch, a reference to a real-life piece of Jewish apocrypha that is said to contain esoteric and divine knowledge. Now, the Beyond, as I said, has the Book of Abon, which is a reference to a fictional grimoire which appears in Lovecraft's fiction. These books are physical links to the weirdness of the world, often prophesizing the arrival of the weird as the audience witnesses it. These elements of prophecy and fate also play into the presence of weird loops, that is, events occurring out of time or repeating in time, that Fisher identifies as another trademark of the weird. Now, these loops are far more evident in the beyond than they are in the City of the Living Dead, playing into the strange atmosphere of the film as a whole. Lisa, the film's main character, who moves from New York to New Orleans, inherits the hotel where the artist was murdered, and afterward, she encounters the blind woman from the flashback in the present day. Lisa visits this woman, who claims her name is Emily, at her home on the edge of town. That same home is later seen in the film to be long abandoned. In a scene even after that, though, when conventional horror logic would dictate that Emily was either a ghost or merely some figment of Lisa's mind, she is seen again, alone in her same home that is now again fully furnished and intact. She is confronted by the undead artist named Schweik, who she seems to know. The nature of their weird relationship is never revealed. While cowering in her home, though, she calls out that she doesn't want to go back and that he can't condemn her, as though she originates or has emerged from the same weird dimension as Schweik, or whatever entity that, like the priest, may be manifesting Schweik's presence. As an entity, Schweik's role in the Beyond is analogous of that of the priest in The City of the Living Dead, he is far more lucid than many of the other zombies in the film, and somehow driven by an otherworldly motivation that is beyond both the character's and the audience's understanding. Interestingly, Emily also seems to share some of these characteristics. Her uncertain place in time makes her a weird entity in her own right, though a less malevolent one than many of the others that Fulci depicts. Narratively, she serves the purpose of delivering the Book of Abon out of the past and into the hands of the main characters, centering her along the arc of the Beyond's core weird loop. Hers is a role, in Fisher's words, in which the orderly distinction between cause and effect is fatally disrupted. She seems to oscillate in her awareness of this role, though. Sometimes she acts as a normal agent within the world. Other times, she acts in accordance with the weird loop that has already been established. She is herself a microcosm of the threshold between the weird and the normal. This contributes to the dream logic of the film itself, leaving the audience uneasy and unmoored from the typical flow of time, the expected order of cause and effect. A couple of interesting notes that may shed some more light on the weird aspects of the beyond. 
Unlike the City of the Living Dead, where characters who are confronted with the weird die of fear, characters in the beyond go blind. This blindness is yet another threshold, demarcating a kind of transcendence for these characters. The change marks them as now somehow part of the weird loops. For instance, at the end of the film, as the zombie threat grows and seems to overtake the city, Lisa and John, a doctor that she had befriended, end up back at the hotel where everything began. Descending into the hotel's basement, the pair pass through an ephemeral threshold, finding themselves in the barren void depicted earlier in one of Schweik's paintings. They both go blind, and as the camera zooms out, they then become the figures that Schweik was painting just before his death, and thus bring their weird loop to a close. As characters, they are trapped in the film's Ouroboros, forever depicting the enormity and inescapability of the weird for the audience. The third and final film, The Gates of Hell Trilogy, is the most divorced from the others, almost veering more into the eerie than the weird. It doesn't have a prophetic book, it doesn't explicitly mention a gate of hell, it doesn't feature the rising of the dead, or at least not in the same fashion as the others. However, it does share the beyond's fixation with weird loops and living juxtapositions. It shares City of the Living Dead's emphasis on vision. It is, in many ways, an implied rather than literal sequel to the first two. On a meta level, this has an era of weird on its own, with the movie carrying echoes of its predecessors. It is sure to not go unnoticed by the audience that all three films star Catriona McColl. The films in this way could be seen as mirrors or doubles of one another, with their weird events and strange loops playing out in tandem to different versions of the same characters. This kind of quality, of the secession or overlapping of time and the present, is one of the things that instill an eerie as well as weird atmosphere to the house by the cemetery. The weird loops here are more immediately obvious and also more inscrutable than in the beyond. There are constant references to events having happened before. The narrative focuses on Norman, a professor who relocated his family from New York City after the suicide of a colleague left a project unfinished. The residents of their new Boston village home insist that Norman may have been there before, many stating that they saw him there with his colleague and a mysterious woman. It is implied that this woman, if indeed she exists at all, is Anne, the babysitter the family hires to care for their young son, Bob. The camera offers constant furtive glances between Norman and Anne, implying some kind of hidden intimacy. After their initial on-screen meeting, Norman catches Anne prying up the boards, sealing off their home's basement door, and yet seems unfazed. The loop here is further complicated by a young girl named May, often only seen by the young son, who is shown at the beginning of the film standing in front of a mannequin that bears more than a passing resemblance to Anne. The ontological hierarchies here are indecipherable, what is real, what is imagined, and more than that, what is merely a surreal metaphor. This quality is one that led films to be reviled by critics in its time, yet is also one that makes it profoundly interesting as an embodiment of the weird. When you trace them back to their origins, many of the ontological tangles that make up the house by the cemetery center around the young girl May, at the very beginning, when the family is still in New York, Bob sees her manifested in the window of a photographed house hung on their wall. Lucy, Norman's wife, later comments that the house they move into, the Freudstein house, named for the sadistic doctor that originally owned it, is identical to the one in their photograph. A photograph that evidently the family has owned for years. 
though Norman is unable to give a clear reason as to why. May continues to manifest, for lack of a better term, to Bob throughout the film. Her role mirrors that of the priest and the artist from the first and second films, though without their same malicious intent. She is merely a lucid apparition, attempting to prevent the tragedy that is inherent to this film's strange loops. In another aspect of the more eerie or unheimlich, she is often seen looking out from the window of a house that seems, again, identical to that of Norman and his family as though she occupies some kind of parallel space to them. This is proved somewhat true by the film's ending, his parents having been killed by an undead Dr. Freudstein who had been living in the basement of the house. Bob escapes through a stone crypt slab into what should have been the house's living room, yet he instead emerges into a mere image of that room, one untarnished by age and with a welcoming fire burning in its hearth. Waiting there are May and her mother, Dr. Freudstein's wife Mary, supposedly murdered decades before. May and Mary are two more figures unstuck in time, neither of their ages lining up with the time since their alleged murder. They take Bob by the hand and walk him off into a tree-lined, mist-filled void, not unlike the weird dimension Lisa and John find themselves trapped in at the end of the beyond. Unlike Lisa and John, though, these characters find no end to their loops here. By the end of the film, they remain trapped in cryptic, unending cycles. Perhaps there was a professor before Norman's colleague, and perhaps there will be one after Norman, always summoned to study the loop, but never one to escape it. The House by the Cemetery is Fulci's ultimate showcase of the weird, trapping the audience in the same warren of fact and illusion as its characters. In this, the film, and indeed, the whole Gates of Hell trilogy, manages to recall Mark Fisher's description of David Lynch's film Inland Empire in the conclusion of his analysis of the weird. The temptation to resolve the film's conundrums psychologically is no doubt great but should be resisted if we are to remain true to what is singular about the film. Instead of looking inside for some final key to the film, we must attend to the strange folds, burrows, and passageways of its weird architecture, in which no interior space is secure for long, and the gateway to the outside can open up practically anywhere.